everyone, my name is Annette Sabo and my PhD topic is male infertility, functionality and surgery. I work at the Center of Entrology, Department of Urology, and my vision is to educate the patients regarding our findings on the risk factors impacting their fertility, and my mission would be a larger scale education of the population. We have four projects currently. Two of them are about sperm DNA fragmentation, and another two are uh, dealing with two groups of patients attending our center. The first one is risk factors associated with sperm DNA fragmentation. We are, currently, uh, we are currently writing the manuscript. We have finished most parts of it. As a background for this topic, uh, I must say that infertility rate is very high in the developed countries and sperm DNA fragmentation impacts fertility. There are several risk factors that might be influencing sperm DNA fragmentation and we'll look at some of them in detail later on. Our aim is to investigate the effect and the extent of potential uh, and suspected uh, risk, uh, risk factors on sperm DNA fragmentation. And our clinical question was, uh, what is the link between different risk factors and sperm DNA fragmentation? Uh, our population included males, and we looked at every pos uh, possible risk factor and compared it to the absence of that risk factor. And in every case, the outcome was sperm DNA fragmentation that we measured. <coughs> Our hypothesis was that there is a correlation between the studied risk factors and sperm DNA fragmentation. We started off with 27,000 articles from which uh, uh, we went down to a bit more than 200 articles uh, from which we extracted data. And we have more than 50 risk factors in total. Just a few words before we move on to the, uh, to the data. Uh, sperm, DNA, uh, sperm DNA fragmentation testing is the only uh, evidence-based sperm functional test that, that there is now. Uh, there aren't any exact cutoffs for the optimal range, but we can say that we prefer to be under 25%. <coughs> between 20 and 30%, we might expect adverse pregnancy outcomes, but between 25 and 50%, they're still eligible for IVF treatment. We did subgroups according to the DNA fragmentation uh, type, uh, assay types that they used, and we also did the groups according to the fertility status of the males. These are the first plots that we have and the risk factors that we looked at. The red ones are the ones for which we have first plots, and the others, for the others, we have only one or two articles. So just to present some of the risk factors, the first one is varicose seal. Uh, our hypothesis was that uh, patients with varicose seal would have a higher DNA fragmentation than those without. And you can see that the main difference here between the two groups was over 10%. We have a high heterogeneity, but we can see that uh, this 11.37% is both a statistically and a clinically significant difference. Another risk factor that we looked at was smoking. Uh, we grouped it according to the amount of cigarettes that they smoked. We compared heavy smokers uh, with non-smokers and uh, moderate smokers with non-smokers. You can see that the mean difference in the first group is 9.6 and, and in the other is 2.93. The heterogeneity in both cases is high. But in the first case, uh, the difference is both a statistically and a clinically significant one. Uh, not in the second case, but you can see that there is a dose dependency. As people smoke more, the DNA fragmentation increases more. Another risk factor that we looked at was sexual abstinence. Um, our hypothesis was that uh, the shorter the abstinence time, the better the DNA fragmentation. Uh, we even advise a short ejaculatory abstinence time. Um, but uh, we did many, many uh, <coughs> groupings, and it came out that there isn't really a significant difference uh, whether uh, they, uh, they have a shorter abstinence period, uh, period or longer one. Uh, another risk factor that we looked at was age. Uh, based on the standard semen, param uh, semen parameters, our hypothesis was that uh, after the age of 40, we would have a bigger increase because uh, you can see a ra more rapid decrease after the age of 40. 
but here, based on the sperm DNA fragmentation uh, assays, uh, what we saw was that the, uh, the, the more rapid increase comes after the age of 50. As you can see, the mean difference for that is 12.58% uh, in difference. So as a conclusion, we can say that varicocele and increasing age certainly increase sperm DNA fragmentation. More studies are needed to clarify the effect of smoking, but the dose dependency is obvious. Uh, and for the abstinence time, the shorter or longer sexu sexual abstinence period does not seem to have a significant impact on sperm DNA fragmentation. Uh, some of the strengths include that we looked at every risk factor that's been looked at up till now. We have a very high number of articles included, and that's a high number of patients. But some of the limitations are that there aren't any longitudinal studies. We can't only look at one single risk factor because there are always others involved. Uh, for some risk factors, we have a low number of studies, and we have a high heterogeneity in almost every case. As an implication for practice, uh, with this knowledge, we can give specific suggestions for each patient based on their own risk factors on how they could uh, possibly decrease their sperm DNA fragmentation. And as an implication for research, we can say that more studies are needed uh, for most of the results to be clear. Uh, and for this reason, we would need to establish registries. I would like to talk a bit more uh, about our first project as well, which is the prediction of sperm retrieval in non-obstructive azospermia via an artificial intelligence software. As a background, we can say that azospermia is when there is no sperm in the ejaculate. There are two types, the obstructive and the non-obstructive type, and here we're dealing with the non-obstructive type. And to retrieve sperm, uh, there are surgical approaches to do so. <laughs> The first one is the biopsy, then the multifocal biopsy, and the best one, uh, the one that yields the highest uh, success uh, with the highest success rate, is the testicular sperm extraction. But currently, we have no means to predict whether we do find sperm when doing the testicular sperm extraction, and for this reason, we wanted to have this artificial intelligence software, which. Uh, predicts the sperm retrieval using preoperative endocrine parameters. And these are the parameters that seem to be of interest. Our hypothesis was that success of uh, sperm retrieval can be predicted using these preoperative parameters, and the clinical implication would be to avoid the unnecessary surgeries and do the surgeries only for the patients where we would have a higher sperm retrieval rate, where we would expect uh, sperm to be found. Uh, in this project, we initially started off with 91 patients. We sent over the data and uh, we got this model back for the 91 patients. Um, and the initial accuracy of the prediction was 65 to 70%. But as we sent over more data, the data of 142 patients, the accuracy for some reason decreased to, uh, to 45 to 50%. So we're currently working on that. We're, uh, we're going to be redoing the, the model, and we'll be sending uh, over even more data. And we're currently thinking of involving foreign centers, but in my opinion, we should deal with the problem here first. Once we have the more accurate software, we will be expanding our network more. And we have two other projects. The, the second one that we have is the efficacies of interventions aiming to improve sperm DNA fragmentation. Uh, for this one, we have the same uh, pool as for the first project. We have, extra, uh, we, we have selected the, uh, the articles from which we're going to be extracting data. And the third one is the non-palpable testicular masses and their testis sparing surgeries. For this one, we have over 30 patients, which is a very high number when it comes to non-palpable testicular tumors. Um, our goal is to submit uh, two of our articles during the summer and the other two in October. And as closing words, I would like to say that today is the first day of the rest of your life. Make it worthwhile to continue. Thank you for your attention.
uh, my first and only question is, um, it, it, it's a great presentation. Thank you for your presentation. But uh, you uh, examined uh, the risk factors separately, right? And uh, my question is, is there any, uh, is there any evidence if uh, simultaneously uh, two or more risk factors occur uh, in, a, in a patient? Uh, how does it uh, compete each other, or, or I mean, how, how does it uh, affect each other for the risk of DNA fragmentation? Well, as much as we could, we examined the risk factors separately. The best articles were where they could pretty much exclude all the other risk factors. For example, if someone was smoking, they excluded overweight patients or drink uh, or uh, drinkers and so on, and there you could see that there was a huge difference, that we could only see the, pretty much the effect of one single risk factor, but we, we can't really uh, compare other risk factors or look at their summed up effect on sperm DNA fragmentation. I don't even know how it would be possible. Like The establishment of a registry might be able to help, but I don't have an idea how we could combine all these and just to separate them. Uh, like, for example, alcohol gives a 2% increase, but he also smokes that an extra 5%. Congratulations on your presentation. Uh, if I uh, understood correctly, you said that um, uh, male infertility uh, increases uh, nowadays. And I wanted to, uh, to ask you that, uh, what do you think uh, the reason behind uh, is so are there uh, new risk factors or more smokers um, have you found anything um, concerning the timeline well we're not 100% sure what co uh, what causes the the decrease in fertility we can say that and that uh, there is certainly a decrease in fertility when we're looking at the standard semen parameters uh, but as you could have seen uh, uh, there are so many risk factors one of them is pollution uh, we have a graph for that as well. It does increase uh, the, uh, it does contribute to infertility, and there are just so many risk factors that we can't point out a single one. Thank you. Amazing presentation. Uh, yesterday and the day before, actually, I didn't have the chance to ask questions because there were so many questions. But uh, I was just, I know we are working together, and I, of course, I know very well this project. And I'm, I've just realized during your presentation whether I forgot it or not. But uh, so this DFI is, uh, uh, of course, uh, very well examined. Uh, a parameter, but still, uh, and I know your second project is about the interventions, but I'm just curious whether you looked also in, in those articles, because uh, can I, because for example, if I'm smoking, I, my, my DFI is higher, and I stop smoking for two days, uh, will that affect, for example, DFI, or uh, simply I go for a run, uh, I quit smoking for a couple of days, and uh, I eat healthy, and uh, of course, uh, I decrease the oxidative stress and uh, uh, the thing that we, uh, the pathomechanism that we think that is behind of this increase. Uh, would it this help actually? Well, the uh, the articles that we have for the interventions project uh, are quite strict when it comes to risk factors. When, for example, there is an article where they're comparing. Uh, uh, alcohol consumers and non-consumers, and the non-consumer must never consume, must have never consumed alcohol in their lifetime. I don't know how that's possible, but uh, but these are the strict uh, criteria they have. Uh, so, well, there aren't uh, there aren't really uh, articles dealing with such short short apps like. Uh, smoke, uh, smoke, uh, quitting of smoking, like two days. They also have strict criteria, so I don't know if that would have any effect, just missing, uh, just not smoking for two days. <laughs>